Hello, and welcome back to the Poetry Podcast with me, Lance Pearson. Program four. I'm in the middle of a run of three of my favourite poems. I explained last time that the first two of them were the two poets I spend one day of my three-day working week trying to popularise. The first, in Programme 3, is John Betjeman. The other one is Gerard Manley Hopkins. You might well feel he is a polar opposite, as different from John Betjeman as chalk from cheese. There are certainly lots of differences. One of the most obvious is that Betjeman is usually completely accessible. He writes in language that anyone can understand. That's one reason for his great popularity. Hopkins, on the other hand, is an acquired taste. When you first look at one of his poems, it seems like a foreign language. He has a huge vocabulary and often uses rare or old-fashioned words in his search for just the right meaning or just the right sound. And if he can't find a word that does the job on its own, he links it with another one, with or without the hyphen. And often with electrifying effect, as the two words spark off each other. Another big difference is the present trajectories of the two poets. People of my vintage generation would probably expect Betjeman to be more popular and widely read than Hopkins, because that's how it was in our younger days when John Betjeman was still alive. But it is no longer so. Betjeman was a child of his age, born 1906, died 1984, and every line he wrote reflected the culture of his times. To many people today, he is of largely historic interest only. His reputation is in decline. But Gerard Manley Hopkins is on an upward curve which has been growing since his lifetime and shows no sign of stopping. He was not a professional writer like John Betjeman. He was a Jesuit Catholic priest who wrote poetry in his spare time. He tried to get some of his poems published, but almost entirely without success, because they were so far ahead of their time. He was only 44 when he died in 1889, and his poems became a labour of love for his close friend and contemporary Robert Bridges. Bridges was aware how strange they seemed to that generation and didn't manage to publish the first collection of Hopkins' poems till 1918, almost 30 years after Hopkins' death. Suddenly, they were in tune with the times. He was, in fact, a 20th century poet who lived in the 19th century. His reputation has grown and grown till he is now regarded in universities as the most significant poet of the Victorian era. I think he may well go on to higher estimates still. Betjeman, at his best, was a very good poet, better than he's often given credit for. But I would never call him a great poet. Hopkins... I consider very great indeed, and I'm not alone. Two small straws in the wind. One is that you would hardly expect Frank Skinner, the comedian, to be a Hopkins fan. Yet he has beaten me by a couple of weeks to putting out a podcast on his almost euphoric love for Hopkins poetry. We've got a link to it on the website. The other indicator that bears this out is a small statistic from YouTube. Eleven years ago, I posted a performance of a famous poem by each of our two poets. 
Betjeman's Christmas, has had almost 9,000 hits in that time. God's Grandeur by Hopkins has had over 26,000, three times as many. And how on earth do I choose a favourite? Virtually all Hopkins poems become my favourite at the time when I immerse myself in them. When the memorial stone to Hopkins at Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey was unveiled in 1976, Sir John Gielgud read God's Grandeur, The Wind Hover, and parts of The Wreck of the Deutschland. I wish I had been there, and I would happily try to echo his tones with any one of those now. But they're just pipped at my post by a much less well-known poem, Epithalamian. Epithalamian is the classical Greek word for a wedding poem. Gerard Hopkins' youngest brother, Everard, was about to get married, and Gerard planned the poem as a wedding present. At this stage, he was professor of classics at a university in Dublin, and while he sat invigilating an exam, he roughed out this draft. Although, as a priest, he had taken vows of lifelong celibacy, he had a very high view of marriage. He saw it as an aftertaste of the Garden of Eden, and this prompts him to some of the most excited, high-flying poetry he ever wrote. He thinks back to a place where he was supremely happy. It's the stretch of the river where the boys at Stonyhurst College went bathing when he used to teach there. He imagines a shy and slightly comic stranger passing by who wants to join in the joyous swimming. It's Everard, and the whole thing is an allegory. He is about to take the plunge into the waters of what Gerard calls spousal love. I adore this poem for the gorgeous language. This is a classic example of where he makes up new words, sometimes by cobbling two old ones together. But I also think it's especially suitable for a podcast, because he starts, Hark, hearer, hear what I do. He is speaking to an audience, more than writing for a readership. Perhaps he planned to read it at the wedding, though it seems he never did. He left it unfinished. But because it's a first draft, he strings long, unedited lines together, trying out all the words that come to his mind. If he had finished it, he would have had to compress it, and because of the way his mind worked, it would have become harder to follow at a hearing. Not that it's dead easy even now. He knows so much and so many words beyond the average intellect that I've put the text with explanations in footnotes on the website, the Poetry Podcast with LancePearson.com, if you'd like to follow it there. Hark, hearer, hear what I do. Lend a thought now. Make believe we are leaf-whelmed somewhere, with the hood of some branchy, bunchy, bushy-bowered wood. Southern Dean, or Lancashire Clough, or Devon Cleave, that leans along the loins of hills, where a candy-coloured, where a glue-gold-brown marbled river boisterously beautiful between roots and rocks is danced and dandled all in froth and water blowballs down we are there when we hear a shout that the hanging honeysuck the dog-eared hazels in the cover makes dither makes hover and the riot of a rout of <laughs> it must be boys from the town 
bathing. How oh, it is summer's sovereign good. By there comes a listless stranger. Beckoned by the noise, he drops towards the river. Unseen, sees the bevy of them, how the boys with dare and with down dolphinry and bell-bright bodies huddling out are earth-world, air-world, water-world, thorough-hurled, all by turn and turn about. This garland of their gamble flashes in his breast into such a sudden zest of summertime joys that he hies to a pool neighbouring. Sees it is the best there, sweetest, freshest, shadowiest. <laughs> Fairy land. Silk beech, scrolled ash, packed sycamore, wild witch elm, hornbeam fretty overstood by. Rafts and rafts of flake leaves light. Dealt so, painted on the air. Hang as still as hawk, or hawk moth, as the stars, or as the angels there, like the thing that never knew the earth, never off roots rose. Here he feasts, <gasps> lovely all is. Hmm. No more. Off with. Down he dings his bleached both and wool-woven where, Careless these in coloured wisp all lie tumbled to, Then with loop-locks, forward falling, forehead frowning, Lips crisp over finger-teasing task, His twiny boots fast he opens, At last he off rings, Till walk the world he can with bare his feet, And come where lies a coffer, Burly, all of blocks built of chance quarried, self quainted, hoar husked rocks, and the water warbles over into filleted with glassy, grassy, quicksilvery shivies and shoots, and with heaven fallen freshness down from moorland still brims, dark or daylight, on and on. Here he will then, here he will, the fleet. Flinty, kind, cold element let break across his limbs long. Where we leave him, frolic, lavish, while he looks about him, laughs, swims. Enough now, since the sacred matter that I mean, I should be wronging longer leaving it to float upon this only gambling and echoing of earth note. What is the delightful Dean? Wedlock. What the water? Spousal love. This poem, too, I have recorded before and with the sound effects that the scene suggests to me. The words are so rich, you can't do them justice at one hearing. I shan't make a habit of this in future programmes, but as with the Betjeman poem, I thought you might like to hear this one again, and with audio enhancement. This time, the obvious sound that he is telling us about is the inviting river swirling and splashing. So this version of the poem is with added running water. Uh, just in case, if you're nowhere near a bathroom, perhaps you'd better leave it till later. Hark, Hera, hear what I do. Lend a thought now. Make believe we are leaf whelmed somewhere with the hood of a branchy, bunchy, bushy-bowered wood, Southern Dean, Lancashire Clough, or Devon Cleave, that leans along the loins of hills, where a candy-coloured, where a glue-gold-brown marbled river 
boisterously beautiful, between roots and rocks is danced and dandled all in froth and water globals down. We are there, when we hear a shout that the hanging honeysuckle, the dog-eared hazels in the cover, makes dither, makes hover, and the riot of a rout of, it must be, boys from the town bathing. It is summer's sovereign good. By there comes a listless stranger. Beckoned by the noise, he drops towards the river. Unseen, sees the bevy of them, how the boys with dare and with down dolphinry and bell-bright bodies huddling out are earth world, air world, water world, thorough hurled, all by turn and turn about. This garland of their gamble flashes in his breast into such a sudden zest of summertime joys that he hies to a pool neighbouring, sees it is the best there, sweetest, freshest, shadowiest, fairy land. Silk beech, scrolled ash, packed sycamore, wild witch elm, hornbeam fretty overstood by, rafts and rafts of flake leaves light, dealt so, painted on the air, hang as still as hawk or hawk moth, as the stars, or as the angels there, like the thing that never knew the earth, never off roots rose. Here he feasts, lovely all is. No more. Off with. Down he dings his bleached both and wool woven wear. Careless these in coloured wisp all lie tumbled to, and then with loop locks forward falling, forehead frowning, lips crisp over finger-teasing task, his twiny boots fast he opens, last he offerings, till walk the world he can with bare his feet, and come where lies a coffer, burly all of blocks built of chance quarried, self quained hoar-husked rocks, and the water warbles over into filleted with glassy, grassy, quicksilvery shivies and shoots, and with heaven-fallen freshness down from moorland still brims, dark or daylight, on and on. Here he will, then. Here he will, the fleet, flinty, kind, cold element that break across his limbs, long. Where we leave him, frolic lavish, while he looks about him, laughs, swims. Enough now. Since the sacred matter that I mean, I should be wronging, longer leaving it to float upon this only gambling and echoing of earth note. What is? The delightful Dean? Wedlock. What the water? Spousal love. Perhaps we all need to make a run for it. So, goodbye for now. As usual, there is further info on the website, The Poetry Podcast with LancePearson.com, including about my other specific Gerard Manley Hopkins podcast. On the next program, we'll reach my favourite poem of all, which is by someone else. <laughs>